Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast Show. I am your host, Josh Monday. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and army veteran. And I'd like to introduce you to my co-host. He's a Christian, devoted husband, and father. What's up, Jason? How's it going? What's up, man? Uh, just, uh, just a little tired today. <laughs> the baby's got you tired, probably. Just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is just life. <laughs> just life yes. you know. <laughs> Same here. And guys, we have a very special show for you guys. Returning guest, okay? He crushes it every time he comes on. Um, guys, I would like to recommend this book, okay? It's called the, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy by Gary Wayne, okay? Please, okay? He does podcasts for free, guys, and he, and he just goes around doing podcasts all the time for every single person. I just ask for you guys to please check out his book, buy it as a Christmas gift or whatever you got to do, man. Hook him up, man. He definitely deserves it. How's it going, Gary? No complaints. Doing very, very well and so happy to be back and uh, congratulations, by the way. Thank so. you. Yeah, I said Gary was supposed to be on on March 27th, guys, and I had my baby that it was uh, he was supposed to be on that Sunday night and I had the baby that morning. So I sent him a picture of my baby like, look, man, I'm so sorry I have to cancel and he's still stuck with us. So thank you, Gary. I appreciate you. No worries. Uh, it's uh, part of the business. So yes, thank you. Um, he, all right. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say, you know, you, even right up to the time when you're actually doing the recording or going live, I mean, there could be technical issues. I mean, you just Anything. don't know until you lay it down. <laughs> and I, I've done shows with podcasters who, uh, and, and very, very experienced ones where they, we do the record and I'll get a note back an hour later saying, Hey, I lost the recording. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? I know somebody that actually that happened to that, that had you on. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know somebody, they told me that that's hilarious. And I was it's, like, it's, it's, a, so it's happened a few times. Oh uh, my gosh. And, and you know, you might be talking about one of our English friends, but I have to tell you, it's happened like three or four times in the last two or three months um yes and very very experienced recorders not wow not that's crazy okay well <laughs> yeah. lord please don't please never never let that happen to us please because <laughs> that's a lot of time and effort but today guys we're going to be going over the black nobility and the committee of 300 um i know that honestly guys if, if there's somebody to go to a go-to person for this type of knowledge i i personally feel that gary wayne is probably the best to go to um there was another person it's uh Amy says WTF. I uh, was trying to get a hold of her, but um, I want I, I got a hold of Gary obviously to do this, but I was trying to get a hold of her to maybe uh, fill in whatever she could fill in as well. But I, I I couldn't get her on. But you know what? It's awesome. We got Gary on, and uh, I appreciate you coming on and and, and coming to tear it up. <laughs> well, thank it. you. Yeah, and when we're talking about you know particularly the committee of three hundred, but I would say even more so in terms of the black nobility, it's so opaque. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless you're actually in at the highest levels, you're trying to sort of piece everything together. So there's a lot of I mean, I don't want to use misinformation, but there's just a lot of confusion out there in terms of where they fit, what they're responsible for. And and it you know, I don't envy people because when I went down the rabbit hole and trying to research secret societies when I was writing my, my book because I felt for some crazy reason I needed to do that I mean I went down that rabbit hole for years trying to figure it out and it, it would just made my mind go to mush and, I bet <laughs> and so we'll try and shed a little bit of light on some of the you know one of the aspects of it but you know the secret society organizational structure is huge uh-huh yeah. Right. I bet. And, and, and there's so many organizations and unless you have sort of an understanding or a way of sort of assembling that um, organizational structure, you'll think, okay, I think I got it. And then all of a sudden you see all these other organizations and then you see other people saying, well, no, they don't fit there. They fit way over here. And it, 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 it just like you're, you're, you're starting all over again because you uh, don't know what you did wrong. Yes. So when we talk about secret societies, there's two things that fit very, very well as we talk about the black nobility and the committee of 300. First of all is, is there's a definite hierarchy. And I know people like to use the pyramids because it's a nice occult sort of symbol, but yeah. you'd have to have dozens of pyramids. And I'm oh, sure okay. you could probably make it work, but it just, because there's so many organizations and, and it doesn't really sort of come together. And all the ones that do, they leave out, important organizations and they have no because they have no way of figuring out how to insert them in yeah 
So I came across an individual uh, a few years ago, and I can't, I, I, I know I've got it in my files, I should look it up, but I was, we're talking about a sp specific term. And uh, he had thrown it back at me because he come out of the secret societies and he said, there's a word for it. And I can't remember, it doesn't really matter because it's more the, the image that it, I think will help for people to understand. But he said, it's a tree trunk. Hmm. That's the word that they use. And it's a trunk of a tree. And if you understand wow. that, you yeah. can start to figure things out. So you have the core organizations that run up the trunk. Uh -huh. okay. And you know, so Freemasonry is the first adept level and it goes, you know, finishes at the apex, at least for the Western societies at the 13 families. Yeah. And then around this tree, you have branches and okay. they intersect all the way up the tree into those trunk organizations. And then as you go out in each one of those branches, there's a hierarchy in there, but we'll answer into that organizational structure. So like Freemasonry, for example, you know, they're, they're responsible for uh, politics and the army. That's um. basically where they focus. They're not completely in charge of it because they're a low level organization. But when you understand there's an, always an overlay of another sort of supervisory organization of the, of the bloodlines over the politics and over the army, it starts to make some sense. And so they would uh, also below that for the smaller organizations, whether it's like the Lions Club, the Elks Club, or yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they're not really. They're, they kind they're of branch off of like little small ones or whatever. Yeah. Small so branches. they'll have representatives little going there, leaves. and yeah, <laughs> so that they do these these things that are getting people into the clubs. You get acceptance. They get a good sort of face value in the marketplace, just like lower 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 Freemasonry. They don't know the true secrets, and they look yeah. like a pretty darn good organization and so they look like boy scouts basically like the the, the the lower level they're like out you know like doing all these charity events yeah. and trying to help people and everyone's like man they're so they're such great people but they don't understand yeah. what's actually at the top which is lucifer right that's on albert pike uh is luciferian doctrine basically right is at the top you know yeah you get up there well exactly and as we it, talk into some of the imagery of the community of 300 we'll we'll get into that a little bit in yes terms of how that that well, that sort of blends in so the other thing to keep in mind is, is that these organizational structures are all answering to the bloodlines and the old bloodlines. Yes. Not new bloodlines. The new blood bloodlines, they're trying to intersect somewhere on the trunk uh, in one of these branch organizations, let's say for new money into the Bilderbergers. And of course, it'll be the higher ups of that, giving them their mar marching orders every year. And in return, they're hoping that their offspring can intermarry into the bloodlines and have a larger role down the road. So when we talk about the old, old families, we're talking about royal families, the oldest families of Europe and older still. Yes. We're talking about the oldest families around the world that go back to the flood. And in yes. their belief system, even before the flood. So the Royal Masonic, as it's understood in China or in uh, the West, takes their history back to before the flood, to the creation of the seven sacred sciences, which masonry is the fifth science. It's mm. geometry in the arts, but it, they, they look at that as masonry, where they take their name from. And one of their specific areas of that is, you know, masonry as in building and the geometry that, that, that goes with that. Mm -hmm. And that um, it was it begat out of the knowledge that was gathered by Enoch, son of Cain, and his descendants, and merged with the knowledge of the fallen angels. Yeah. And it was considered too valuable to be shared amongst the mundane. So they formed mysticism, Enochian mysticism, a sun worshiping cult. Enochian mysticism is a direct product of Enoch and everything is a solar as opposed to a lunar perspective from a sort of Israelite mm. understanding that was passed on, on to them. And out of that was the mystery schools, which the secret societies were developed from. So even when you go to university schools today, yeah. They have all of these little initiatory organizations and in some of the, the skull, and, bloods, bone, the skull, yeah, the skull and, bones. and bones. Yeah. They have like actually like Yale has a lot of ones that aren't even big that people don't even know about um, exactly. that, I, that I was like kind of researching that that were it's pretty interesting. Even 
a lot of these these schools have these little organizations that we don't even a lot of us don't even hear about whatsoever unless yes. you start peeling back the onion right on these things yes exactly so that's been kind of the organizational structure that's come down through the histories and um, you know, the modern organizations, uh, which the Committee of 300 is part of the, you know, the new model, that gets reorganized up after the fall of the Knights Templar. Okay. Right. And with the fall of the Knights Templar, they had to do something that was a little bit different because they had everything centralized in there. Yeah. I mean, the they banking, controlled the, yeah, the military. They controlled the, yeah, yeah. The, they controlled the church. They controlled what was outside of the church. They controlled the literature. They controlled the education, the banking. Um, you know, it's just so many different aspects that you know they had to decentralize. Is probably the best way of putting it. And so they start to come together with uh, the fall of the Knights Templar, and probably just before with the cutting of the elms of splitting away with some of the higher adept levels because they had thought that the Templars had lost their way because they had just lost Jerusalem the year yeah. before, right? Yeah. And that they're more interested in their army and they're more interested in their banking and wealth and the politics and everything else that they were involved on. And so that happened at the Cutting Elms in 1188. And so... Um, by the time of about 1300, um, <clears throat> you have, you know, some distance that's put in and you have this whole grand master um, adepts that are running the Templars that are continuing. But after the fall, you get a group called the invisible ones that are the splitting away at the cutting of the elm. And there's 33 of them. They're yeah. still families above them at that time you brought um, up the invisible 33 like that was for me i was like man because we, we you know we had the jesuit podcast you were talking about the invisible 33 you know then and i'm yep. like i'm like what is the invisible 33 i mean it, invisible as in we're not going to know who they are or invisible that's just <clears throat> what they were called yeah they were invisible as in they just they they had a society that that was that secret and that high up in terms okay. of the major sort of kings or sons of kings at that time so they met actually met with the pope in mm. 1317 okay and they wanted to recreate the templars inside and and the uh, pope at that time said yeah we should do that but i am going to control with my people yeah how this is going to be organized and run and they said no and they went underground and so the invisible ones, you see that sort of uh, show up in some of the imagery that it's like a hidden hand. They want to be invisible and behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah. Uh, you have the invisible college, which was created by the Rosicrucians and the uh, Freemasons in 1662, which is the Royal Society, which controlled the education and science outside the church. Wow. And so when we look at these uh, invisible 33, um, they are going to, you know, expand that as time goes forward. And so where they would be known as kind of the, the Rosicrucians of that time uh -huh. and that Red Cross order that goes back into ancient history. And of course, you know, St. Bernard, um, he was the one who was a Cistercian that was, you know, a big proponent of starting the Templars and was of the bloodlines yeah right okay he uh, he donned them with the red cross of that ancient order so that goes with the rosicrucians when those adepts and those bloodlines they 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 leave uh the templars and before they fall and so they show up like in 1400 um they're actually organized in about 1323 the first order that we see is, is with robert the bruce and it's for the adepts of the escaping knights templar that went to scotland and it's the rosy cross order mm. um you start to see them in about 1400 uh with the uh 1397 probably is more exact with the sarconi ron which is the ordo draconis to put their kingships back on the thrones and push back and begin the pursuits of thought which is the wisdom of Egypt that, you know, reunites a reformation. And so as these things sort of roll forward and they're going to put 
the Jesuits back in place yeah. uh, with uh, the Montessa order that we've talked about in, 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 in yeah. past shows. Yeah. And they're going to get a hold of the banking and with a fellow by the name of Borgia, who's deeply connected to the black nobility. Yes. He yes. is one of the name. descendants of the three Borgia popes. Uh -huh. Right. And he is in charge of the Montessa order in 1317. No, I'm sorry. He takes over the organization that was formed in 1317 to get the wealth in Spain for from the Templars so that the church didn't get it. Yes. And in the 1500s, he's sponsoring Ignatius of Loyola and along with the king of Spain to set the Jesuits up to be the new Templars. And then by 1570, Borgia, who's the Grand Master of the Montessa Order, becomes the Grand Master of the Jesuit Order. So they've got okay. control of that. Uh, you know, within so the Borgia bloodline is like a, a part of the black nobility, basically, right? Because I've, I've heard is. that name, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, all right, so that connects yeah. to the black nobility there, okay? Yeah, so now you can imagine that as the populations grow and the generations grow, the families sort of get bigger and bigger, right? So that's when you come up with uh, kind of the committee of 300. It's mm. hard to know exactly when that sort of comes about yeah but these are still representatives of all the bloodline families and they said above the rosicrucians which also is 50 percent um bloodline and then of the other ones coming up through the freemasonry and the illuminati sort of up the trunk so okay so the committee of 300 are blue bloods those are original blue blood uh yes uh from like basically those are like the bloodline they kept it going and, and that's the, the committee of 300 yeah. have to be like that the rosicrucians are okay being 50 50 is what you're saying yes but you okay. have to be yeah you're but you you're gotta be all, up there though yeah <laughs> yeah so and okay. you probably have different family representatives of the bloodlines and the rosicrucians right yeah yeah definitely right. so and everybody in the masonic royal bloodlines if you're in that family and you're part of what they do. Everybody has a role. Yeah. Like it's, it's very, very structured and sort of organized. So what the committee of 300 is, is they are uh, a bloodline order that is connected to a number of orders that are fitting in sort of the, the that, that, uh, the branches and, and the tree trunk. And so they're kind of involved on, um, some people say politics, but more at a distance, right? More of an oversight. Some people say media, but again, maybe, but more of an oversight. The Rosicrucians definitely answer directly to them because mm -hmm. they're right below them. Yeah. Uh, again, maybe some oversight on the military and oversight on Freemasonries, but they're really f focused on kind of the banking side. Yeah. And kind of where the Rothschilds might link in. The Rothschilds yeah. might actually link in one lower at the Rosicrucians, but yeah, they they got, they're probably in... a 50 50 bloodline, not a, not a full it, bloodline, right? Yeah, so there... question, though, can I ask a question? Did the yep. Rothschilds change their name from something else to? From Bauer. When they set the, up the London Bauer? Bank in about 1810 to 1812, they changed their name from Bauer to the Rothschilds, which is the Red Shield or. You know, it's part yeah. of the imagery of the Rosicrucians, right? Oh, man. Which is why I kind of linked them into the Rosicrucians. Not quite because, you know, they were Jewish mysticism. Yeah. But yeah, they, I was, weren't, I was they weren't because, these uh, super strong bloodlines, right? I heard, yeah. that, so, I heard that they were Edomites. Before, like, I heard something about that. They were Edomites and, and they were direct enemies of, of the Israelites, but they changed yeah. their name to... Well, if they were Edomites and if they were of the Herod bloodline, that would be a significant ancient bloodline because that's the bloodline that goes back through, you know, the Hadad dynasties and the Edomite dynasties and back to the Dukes of Edom mm -hmm. and the Dukes uh, of the people that were there before Esau to the Hori, right? Mm. I mean, these are really, really ancient bloodlines. Yeah. If, if, if that indeed is the connection, which means that they would have been a little bit higher up and they wouldn't have been introduced. So they may have had diluted bloodlines that go yeah. back because yeah. they would keep their genealogies, right? So you have to kind of look at that. What they're trying to do is they're trying to guide the economic destinies through the oligarchs. Of the whole entire world, right? Not, yes. not just of like... The 
So some people whole... will be like, okay, well, they're just trying to control the city of London. They're trying to just control Rome. They're just trying to, but they're trying to, they're doing the whole entire world. This yes. is like mm-hmm. a world uh, organization, almost like the Bible talks about, like a, a yep. one world government. Yep. Basically. Yeah. And working with families around the world at the direction of the 13. And some people yes. say there's 13 families in other places or for the whole world as well. Yeah. So I'm not sure quite how that intersects because obviously I'm still, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh dang gary you, there's something you don't know oh no way man this, this. i haven't been able to get access to that that, that information yet <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so, well hey but you know they what might, I, they, they might have to kill me if i did I yeah guess. if you once you get that information you need to text me so i know i get to put you on the show immediately so, <laughs> just kidding okay yeah. i have a question i have a question yeah. gary so we're talking about like the banking system and the controlling the economic uh you know so the so there's like a, something called the Crown Estate. It's a they own 6.6 billion acres of land. Okay, so mm-hmm. some people will say that that's under the Windsor family, but she doesn't own it. Um, is that uh, all those all that land and all that is that is that like owned by the Black nobility or is that owned by the Committee of 300? Is that everybody's money all together? Because that's like a third of the the land in in, in the world that they own. And yeah, uh, they, they would own more than that. Okay, so yeah, do, do you so. know what the Crown Estate? <laughs> so um, it's called the crown just, estate i don't know if yeah, you've heard of it yeah, yeah. just it's just difficult to trace it back to them right yes yes their their money is not on the books yeah and their complete land isn't on the books okay and so if, if people think that let's say um musk is the richest guy in the world today and he's, oh yeah um, that's i know yeah, i know th- that's peanuts yes to yes the wealth Right. I know. That, Even the Rothschild family is like 800 billion or something. I mean, that's yeah. so you can imagine what these other families are. Yeah. So you have to and you have to know that to understand why they needed control of the banking so yes. that they can have the Swiss banks. Right. Yeah. So that they can hide everything and still be able to to control. So um Obviously, the Rothschilds are going to be a significant part in terms of the banking outside of the church with the Jesuits, which they got control of, we already talked about within the church that was sort of um, started at the fall of the Knights Templar, where they took a lot of their money directly to Switzerland, where the Knights of St. John already was. So that's okay. That's the Knights of Hospitaller, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. The Knights so, of Hospitaller. So guys, Look up that. That's, that's yeah. it's insane information. Look up yeah. that. Knights, so of, Knights of Malta, Knights of Rhodes, Knights of St. John, Hospitallers, all the same organization, just different name. As yeah. they have, and in a lot of cases, as they move to different islands for their headquarters. But yeah, so they, they and the Jesuits would link into um, different parts of the black nobility. Yeah. It, through the, uh, the family of 300 and maybe Knights uh, Order of St. John might even go a little bit higher and in into the 33 because it, the Jesuits are more from the Italian black nobility. Yes. But the Knights of St. John, they yeah. are the, they are, they have to be like a firstborn or secondborn son of a true Royale to be a member. It's, so, it's, it's interesting, man. When I studied that, I studied, I tried to study it before one of our shows. And I remember you said Knights of St. John. Yeah. And then at the very end of the show, I caught it. And I was like, are you talking about the Knights of Hospitality? You're like, yes. I'm like, oh my goodness. I've been trying to study them and try to find out about them. So it's, it's, it's super interesting stuff. It's, it's, you really have to yeah. peel back the onion really deep to find out about these things. Yeah. So a lot of these and, are and names are course, schools too. Like you have yeah. a lot of these names are like Loyola, St. John's. These are all top colleges in the United States. Like there's yeah, also Georgetown. Columbia. There's yeah. also like uh, all Jesuit uh, schools. Yeah, that's crazy though. But so, it's like they, they they control that. Yeah. So you can imagine there might have been a little bit of concern within the ranks when the current pope, who's a Jesuit, yeah, the black pope became the not white only pope. took over the Knights of Saint John, but replaced the Grand Master with his own guy. Wow. So he consolidated power, and yeah. is is become more formidable as one united group that's answering up in up the top so that you can expect to be some conflict there down down the road <laughs> of course um they are the they're sort of known as the um the economic force for the new world order so okay. they're going to have be heavily working through uh and have their people on the club of rome that have set up the world into 10 spheres of influence 10 
uh, groups of nations, 10 trading blocks, whatever you want to call them, to form that end time world government, because that ultimately world government with the universal polytheist religion is, is their ultimate goal. The Bilderbergers that have all of the, you know, like the owners of Shell and the stuff that are meeting with uh, the, the, the new money people once a yeah. year and giving them their marching orders. Um, the Bilderbergers are a, a significant sort of organization that branches out of that. The IMF is controlled at that level, even though you've International got- Monetary Fund yep. is what it is? Yep. International yep. Monetary Fund. Because okay. they control the money for that, right? Yeah, so you've yeah. got people coming up through the system who are at lower level on the degrees working there. Yeah. But they're pulling the strings and also the World Bank. And those are the main ones that I found that they're actually working with. And who they're working with is that term oligarchs. Yeah. The oligarchs. I've seen world. oligarchs before. Yeah. Yeah. Been, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if they're visible, they're not the true oligarchs. They're... <laughs> sort of, right okay they're like the puppet that's like 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 the windsor family for example right so they got the queen yeah everybody's like oh like i even at one time you know before i started like studying your your stuff and yeah. i was like who's who's more powerful the pope or the queen like yeah. it's because i just didn't peel back the onion enough so now that i got to our episode yeah. 66 now of our show i'm already to the point where i'm like i already know about the queen the windsor family yeah. and everything and, and i know yeah. that they're not it's not the two that are powerful yeah. because we know yeah. about them there's, yeah. there's so, way more powerful people yeah so you have like uh the the knights of saint john the hospitalers are technically on a portion they report directly to the queen mm. but on the true that's what they say order, yeah okay. but that's the protestant side yeah the catholic side still goes up through the channel that we're talking about the black nobility right and yeah then, okay so a history of how we start to see the committee of 300 kind of starting to come together. Um, some people take it back from, again, a biases, although it's linked as the first, let's call it the second monster corporation because the Templars were really the first yeah. beast. Uh, mm -hmm. So the East India company. Yes, with, and I, with, I, with the empire was I did a show on this actually the British East India Company and the East India Company with uh, with Sophia Smallstorm so I, I'm pretty familiar with that but go ahead. right and that was chartered by Queen Elizabeth the first yeah right and so it's it's in around 1600 but it actually goes back you know uh, further than that that would be sort of a, a big gambit with the uh, of how the 300 is is starting to put mm. things together um that's interesting so you have the old families and that's where you, if you want to get where it really sort of starts and that's when you start to get into the old families of europe and, and the black nobility and we'll talk about the black nobility of italy as a side the papal, the right? papal bloodlines basically yeah. okay yeah if we can so and so this was really formed in about 1171 Okay. And that date, that date should kind of ring a bell when I was talking the about Templar, 11, right? 1188, yeah. Yeah. where, you know, you actually see some actions of, we're not happy with what's going on in this current sort of structure, at least that would, how, that would be how I interpret it. And that was formed in Vienna with the Habsburg dynasty. Okay. Right. That's a big name right there. Yeah. Yeah. And especially as it. Uh, just hang on here a second. I no problem. Get, I got to get plugged in or I'm going to lose you. Okay. No problem. So this will only take a second. No problem, guys. So, uh, yeah, okay, so we're far. Back plugged in. <laughs> no problem. So far, it's been awesome. So, yeah, well, no problem. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. So you have the Black nobility of Vienna is sort of, sort of, um, arranging this and and that should ring a bell in terms of the Sarkani Rond organization which is the Ordo Draconis which is that sort of continental push to get the thrones back into a position and away from some of the German sort of oversight and so you have some old bloodlines from many many countries and this is not going to include the Russians mm -hmm. And it does piece in some of the Slavs as it let's go, let's say, go into, you know, the bloodline of Vlad the Impaler, right? Yeah. From Hungary, yeah. but only to Hungary because that connects through with the Anjou family. Right? Prince Philip was saying he's, he's, uh, he has that bloodline, right? Or Prince Charles has Vlad yes, the Impaler. Prince bloodline. Charles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And so the bloodlines that I found that, and there, there's probably a few more, but the old families, the, they have different classifications, but obviously Italy, Austria that we've talked about, Germany is in there, of course. Um, they're not as certainly as visible, especially with, you know, the Kaisers being toppled and like the Habsburg were, you know, lost their kind of dynasty as well, but they're working behind the scenes. Poland is in there, which most people don't know. France, of course, um, yeah. England, the Netherlands, Spain, and Spain's a very important one with the yeah. King of Jerusalem title and the Bourbon family who yeah. received the Jerusalem title from uh, the Habsburg Lorraine, Portugal, Sweden, and of course the Swiss. Now there's probably some more, but those are the main of the old families of Europe that are, would have some sort of I'm not sure how they split that representation up into the 13 and then into the 33 and then into the 300, but you get a flavor of that's the black nobility of yeah. Europe, of the greater black nobility, also known as Rex Deus or the Kings yeah. of God, because they believe they received their divine right to rule from the Balim of Mount Hermon. Yeah, you spoke about the German too, and the, the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha, which is that's what the Windsor family came it from, is. right? Yeah, exactly. So that, that's they came from Germany, and then they ended up yeah. coming over. They switched their name because of the the World War that happened. So they, yep, they World they War just, One, yeah, just changed it to Windsor. So then yep. you're like, why? Why are they? How could they even be the you know the yeah. the queen yeah, of 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 you know of England? What happened well, was. Even, you know, and it has a lot to do with the timing of the American Revolution, right? Yeah. You have the Stuarts uh, between the Protestant Stuarts and the Catholic Stuarts. And, uh, you know, after, it's you know, Queen Elizabeth, there, it was a back and forth on who's, you know, and they, they needed, they wanted stability. They wanted to get away from that bloodline. And so they brought in the Saxon bloodline. I understand Saxons have a history yeah of their original kings coming from there wow so that's yeah. sort of that connection as to um why the hanovers were brought in with with king george and yeah. so um so when we look at it from from that perspective then uh it starts to make um a little bit more sense uh, these are very much hidden and very very old um, and it's that feudal class that they had, right? I yeah. mean, they, they, they imposed that for, for centuries. So they're also known as the Olympians, the Committee of 300. You know? Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, I heard about yeah. that. Yeah. And that's a little bit sort of hard to crack at times if you're, well, you know, why are they the, the Olympians? Because 300 doesn't sort of match up with how many Olympian gods there were, right? Yeah. Um, but the number 13 does yeah like you have 12 parent gods 12 offspring gods that took over and they worship satan so that's 12 plus 1 is 13 for 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 satan oh. and they they're called the uh the cult of Di they call themselves a, a cult of dionysius which is kind of the builder um knowledge that comes yeah. that lost knowledge that you see all wow. these great buildings or the cult of isis so they're equally sort of looking at egypt and, and greek and also they 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 pay a lot of homage to their religion as it comes through the gnostics through the cathars which is is part of the 300 they're all sort of cathars or bogomils if you're not familiar with bogomils as you read through my book i'll give you that history that's the bogomils are amalgamation of a number of polytheist gnostic organizations that were exiled outside of rome and they got outside of the region into the bulgaria region and they call themselves the bogomils and they're the ones who started the branch cathar and albigensian uh, churches into France that by the time of the Albigensian uh, crusade had grown through the backing of the black nobility wow. to a position of all, having the ability to overthrow the Roman church. Wow. That's why you had the war. Wow. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. So, and so it's, it's, it's good to understand that. So they believe they have the power of the Olympians. Yeah. Because they, they look at themselves as, as, as little gods and that they're a set above the God of the Bible. And of course, they worship Lucifer and yeah. they're called and they call themselves also the invisible ones as well. 
because they're working behind the scenes and in secrecy. Yeah. And of course, they're from uh, the Council of 33 families that um, have spun out. Now, if you look at the occult level of uh, some symbology of the number 300, and it's not a normal number that people would sort of look at. And there's a lot of different things that are out, out there, but 300 um, symbolizes in that they do the inside out, upside down of this as how it comes out, uh, how it was put out in um, oh, the Middle Ages. I think that's when, when the term came out. But it was originally, as it comes out from Catholicism, was the forces of evil um, led by Satan, um, these are the forces God would overthrow, but it's the inverse of that. So they believe wow. in the forces of evil are over, which is God is overthrown by Satan or Lucifer. Yeah. And that's kind of where they look at that as T from being, uh, the formation of the number 300 in Greek that they say is the Christian cross, but it's that rosy red cross that I was talking about earlier, or some people think it's the onk, which I'm, I'm perfectly fine with as well. And yeah. if you're looking at it from a cross perspective, this is the same cross of Malta. This yeah. is the cross of the Anunnaki. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. So they, they draft that in with an overlay <clears throat> it into Christian sort of ideology, but understand the cross, the Maltese cross is a different formation of a cross yeah. than the <clears throat> typical cross that we would understand. <clears throat> it. So this is the cross that you see on, on the night order. So when you have all these sort of different kind of night orders, there's some, you know, a lot of them are symbolizing. Like you know, it looks like an cross. iron cross almost. Yeah. Right? yeah. Cross. yeah. They're all stylized of the Maltese cross. Yeah. And, and these are some of the major night orders that would be part of that group of Templars, Knights of St. John, and it's this uh, St. Sepulchre order, the Knights of Malta, the Templars, the St. Jacques de la Paix, and the, it's Teutonic on here, but it's the, it's the uh, Teutonic Knights of Germany, right? Mm. And there, there were all sort of knight orders. 300 is also the angels of their new Eden. Wow. that they look at as as something to do with the new age that they're doing because they're trying to create if you look at their imagery and ideology and the writings a new eden they want okay. to reinstate eden but it's a new eden where um, they're ruling right they want to be the ruling. they want to be yes. the rulers and yeah. we are the ruled right that's that's yeah. what they love right mm. 300 in greek everybody's heard of the battle of thermopylae and and uh, that's 300 but there's another meeting in greek in terms of where that 300 comes from and 300 was the number of the guard that protected the king of greece which would be their archetypical type of antichrist figure oh okay wow okay so they're not going to know who exactly is the antichrist even though there's going to have they're going to have three of them ready all of the time there's only a very very select few but they are working protection throughout the world to protect these antichrist figures so that they're ready at any point in time pythagoras wow. who is a significant patriarch in their belief system of receiving the knowledge from hermes from the knowledge that he found uh under the pyramids that we've talked about that's the enochian 36,525 <clears throat> books was passed on to pythagoras he had 300 disciples wow. that was passing this knowledge down hmm. and another one that goes back and it's really it's, it's really sort of opaque but they look at that as a trident you know how uh, Zeus, Zeus and Poseidon and some other gods had a trident <clears throat> yeah. um, as, as part of the imagery. And they look at that as 300 as a symbol of that trident as three in one. So if you look at that, you say, well, how, how does that make any sense? You got three plus zero plus zero. That's the trident as three oh, in one, wow. right? As the imagery goes. Like a trinity almost, right? Yeah. Three and in it's, one. The, it's the perfect unity as, as in the Tau which is that same cross that they have. That's the same T that's in the Greek letter T that they were using as the superficial could, definition. Could it also be like Satan, uh, the Antichrist and the false Messiah would be like three in one also maybe, or like, that's kind of like, yep. I don't know. Yep. Does that, yeah, that they, have to do with it? They, they have that Trinity as well, right? Yeah, they yeah, have, yeah. 
they have, uh, you know, as a lower level allegory, it would be Osiris, Isis, and Horus, as yeah. in, right? And, and of course, Horus is the demigod, antichrist type figure. Isis yeah. is the Holy Spirit, mother goddess, and Osiris is, is the is the male god so yeah. so just take that up a level to the pyramid god level maybe even a little bit higher depending on whether or not one thinks of uh, satan as being amongst the parent gods or still above that right that's why we see like like washington like the washington monument has you know you see that you, you see like all like you, you kind of see like all the egyptian stuff that that they're worshiping yeah. in washington dc um so that's why you're seeing all this stuff all across the world like the city of london has it yep. uh the city of Rome obviously has it. Um, all of their El cities. Blisk and all this stuff. Yeah. All of their great cities have <laughs> sacred geometry, pentagrams, yeah. old uh, architectural sort of recreations, obelisks from Egypt. I mean, yeah. all, all sorts of things like that. And the last thing on the 300 is that that... Um, that cross is is the also thought to be the Egyptian and the Aryan cross as well. Okay. So, so you got two different <clears throat> crosses in there. One is more like this, and then there's the Maltese cross, and they all have sort of separate sort of sort of meanings. So that's sort of my understanding of the committee of three hundred. Wow, um, that was deep. That was a, that was deep. Everything you were saying right there was just it's so interesting, man. It's like I, I have to every time I listen to our shows, I have to like with you, I have to like start studying more and more and more. I'm going down <laughs> so much rabbit holes is crazy. I love well, it. There's, though. there's so many of those, of those <clears throat> rabbit holes. So. It's, okay. Uh, so that's, that's more the committee of 300. So the black nobility part, like, um, like, like, can we go over some of the orders, like the, like the order of golden fleece and like the order of garter and some of those, does yeah. that have to all do with the black nobility too? And yes, maybe the yes. papal bloodlines. Okay. Yes. Well, if you can get into that, I mean, whatever, whatever, however you want to take it from there to get into the black nobility, that'd be amazing. Yeah, the, the the main one to keep in mind is is like the the the, the garter order is a lower level one that comes out of England and it's just yeah. for um, low bloodline people or people that are rising. It's not that significant uh, uh, of yeah. an order. The seraphim uh, one that you told me about, I think, was the one that yeah. you said to pay attention well, to. Yeah, yeah. Well, that the, the seraphim order it, it it's sort of the Swedish or the Norse order of the of the bloodlines yeah right and so <clears throat> when you look at the occult and you look at the dominant sort of histories that form sort of the western sort of mysticism odin and that history is always very very important mm -hmm. so you have like days of the week that come out of you know, like uh, Wednesday for being for Odin and Thursday for being Thor and fr Friday for Frida. It's not just Whoa. the Roman um, yeah. pantheon and the Greek pantheon. They've mixed that in there for 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 a reason. Wow. Um, and that in the bloodlines you have coming out of there, you have that Rolo bloodline that changes their name to St. Clair. Mm. Um, in when they expropriate Normandy from the French in 912 you know ad and so they sign this the treaty of saint Clair, and they change their name to that and then they're going to intermarry with the bloodlines of of the anjou and all of the bloodlines of rex du deus that's what that's within france now this bloodline is also the same name as the St. Clairs, which is the transliteration as, as when they moved to Scotland and, and into England and they, they set up Freemasonry. That's I was and, just about to ask you. They, they and, set up yeah. the Freemasons right in, in Scotland. Okay, cool. So, yeah. And outside. one of the unnamed original founders of the Knights Templar and a battle partner of Hugh de Payon is Henry St. Clair. Okay. Awesome. All right. right? So go, they go back that far into that sort of connection. Mm. And as you look at what happens over in England, you have the Norman conquest over the Saxon kingship. Yeah. That's finalized by William the Conqueror, who's the bloodline of the Rollo and the, and the St. Clairs. Mm. Right. 
And they're going to have that for a few hundred years until they start intermixing with the Anjou and they end up pushing the Normans out until the Tudors overthrow the Anjou, right? But there's <laughs> that, anyway, but, but just to give people <clears throat> an understanding of, of the Plantagenet, that's the Anjou, right? Yeah. And so you also have coming across with the St. Clairs, you have the De Bruces coming across. So the uh -huh. De Bruce are going to intermarry with the Scottish bloodlines Mm -hmm. right yeah. um to get the scottish throne and robert the bruce who protects the knights templar because he's been excommunicated by the pope at that time for murdering his rival in a catholic church he gives mm. the the uh, the knights templar protection and then sponsors with the saint Clairs, the you know the freemason on a corner and the first visible sort of rosy cross order in 1323 oh my God. and this is the daughter of Bruce that is going to give the name to the Stuart dynasty, who she marries. And Stuart's that's a big, big name too, right? To the Stuart yes. dynasty. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. This is all crazy. Awesome information. Yep. We love it. We love it. Yeah. Keep it coming. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> when we, when we look at the, the Norse bloodlines, we have to, you know, just say, well, let's just, just can't throw away this Knights of the Seraphim. Yeah. I mean, the Seraphim are the watchers that they believe that created the original Nephilim. Wow. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. The Seraphim. Okay. Okay. So that's all right. So you have the, the golden fleece order of the Habsburgs. That's probably the most important one uh, that, that, that we're talking about here. That's connected to the, the Bourbon family. And that's heavily influenced through the Anjou bloodlines uh, that come out of the Lorraine region. And, and those are the three, three families that are kind of accredited as the main founders of the Knights Templar. It's the Payan, the Bouillon, and Anjou, the Northern Anjou. And I understand there's Anjou in Hungary. Mm. And also there's Anjou in the Mediterranean and they're kind of rivals on, on, on the bloodlines. Mm. But where the Anjou... Uh, De Payan and De Boulian families come from is the Lorraine region. So when that bloodline intermarries with the Habsburg, yep. it becomes the Habsburg Lorraine dynasty, right? Because yeah. of the ennobled bloodlines and the King of Jerusalem title is going to follow into the Habsburgs, which now ends up with the Bourbon family out of Spain. And where the King of Jerusalem title starts with is with the Anjou and depending on which history you're reading it's either baldwin the the first or baldwin the second it doesn't matter it's all part of the same family yeah um and and they're crowned in a small priory on the rock of sion in mm. um jerusalem the first king of jerusalem because they take their bloodlines back to the merovingians as the yeah. last survivor of Dag who's dagobert who had not only nephilim bloodlines um, but wow. they also believe that they had um, bloodlines from King Saul, Benjamite wow. bloodlines, Zion wow. in. And, and King Solomon from, is huge in the Freemasonry. I mean, they love, they love that. The whole yeah, and, and that's a different, yeah. But yeah, different though. King yes. Saul and uh, King David. Yeah. And then through wow. the Camelot dynasties, through Aragon and Aminabad, and through the third son of allegedly of Mary Magdalene and... Mm. Uh, Jesus, his name yeah. was Josephes, married into the Camelot dynasties through Aragon and Aminabad of the Merovingian dynasty. They had the Jesus bloodline. But, you know, you have the Da Vinci Code yep. sort of based on that. that belief. Yeah, yeah. The Gnostic that's what, beliefs. That, we don't have to believe it, but that's what they believe. But yeah. I do think that they may have some legitimate claim on maybe the Gen Benjamites who had migrated up the Danube and into Germany. And that's where they, through the St. Cambium Franks where that bloodline comes in. Yeah. The thing is about that is that the Benjamites in the time of the Exodus were awarded Jerusalem mm. by Joshua. Wow. That's okay. why that King of Jerusalem title is so important for them that they want to crown Antichrist with as, as their dragon Messiah. Yeah. And so this, this, uh, King of Jerusalem title is going to pass through to Hungary first mm -hmm. to the Anjou there. And then it's going to go up into Lorraine and then down through history. You just have to follow it for the King of Jerusalem title and you get that part of the Anjou. But there's, all, there's the Sicilian and Italian Anjou 
uh, claim to it as well, and they claim to have it as well. It's from a different branch of the Anjou in in their squabbles, and I got a document on it where it sort of intersects for people, but they make a claim very shortly after. You remember that uh, movie, The Kingdom of Heaven? Yeah, the Kingdom just, of Heaven. I was going to watch that today. I was going to watch yeah. the... In the document, uh, I, I, and I, I don't have it memorized off the top of my head, but I'll show you in that document the, the names and the families and how that splits into the two lines of the Anjou. But those names are all representative of their internal history. Not wow. quite as the characters as being played because they're obviously more powerful and more ennobled. I'm gonna watch that though for sure. I gotta yeah. see that now. Yeah, but I'll send I'll send you the the three part series on that. Okay. That I have that that no, it's not there. It's on another document. It's on the Mount Hermon. I'll I'll send you that one, and please. I'll probably send you the companion one, and you can sort of read through that. Okay, please. Yeah, I'll I'll, rem I'll remind you too because I know you got probably a lot of people asking for documents all the time. So yeah, I, I ran about two weeks behind on answering my emails, so, but I do <laughs> I do get though I get to them all. I just <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah that's so. all that stuff is amazing so you're going through so the king of jerusalem which people people don't even understand that there's that they even have that you know they think oh king david and then after that they, people don't even realize that the king of uh jerusalem title even continued on yeah. you know right yeah so you know at the cutting of the elm that was at geezer's castle mm -hmm. and uh they have this large um arch there that's uh, the grand arch and uh, what they believe is, is that has been built for when they actually crown the king of Jerusalem, who they call the grand monarch, in af right after he's crowned, he's going to march through that as sort of that announcement, or that's the announcement to the world that he is the false messiah, and then will be crowned in the temple of, of Jerusalem. So they've wow. created that. That was at the location of that, that cutting of the elms that, that we were talking about. Wow. So they so thought they were bringing the Antichrist probably back then, right? When they yeah. did, like they probably thought they were, and they're like, okay, it's not time yet. But you said they yep. got three people they're, ready to go lined up, like at time. all times. All the wow, time. that yeah. is so interesting. Yeah. I never even knew that. I, I that's so that's so interesting. Yeah, and so you know when you saw the uh, Damien movies of the Antichrist, that's the old series, yeah, yeah, and they yeah. had these people around it. They they've got guardians that protect them, and the three hundred are sort of considered the I guess the, the apex of how that um, guarding of those bloodlines and those specific Do you have to be of a certain bloodline to be the Antichrist? Do you yes, have to be, you, you have do? to be, your pedigree is going to be presented when they step the Antichrist forward. And, but keep in mind, there's going to be rivals around yeah. the world. Do you yeah. think that's why they put out like uh, those family trees and stuff like yes. that for like people to see their where yes. their where, where their uh, their family history like those uh, what is it, like yep. 23 what is it called like 23 me or something like that or yep. yeah. that's crazy they, they they could have your they could have actually your information that could date back to where like yeah maybe you were related to vlad the impaler or maybe you are related to that's crazy that that's I don't know, that yeah. Insane. yeah yeah well and and just look at the coat of arms that the royal families have i mean yeah. all of that has it's the dragon classic. They got a lion. They got the. It's all. Yeah. It's all like. Uh, like it's all about prophecy. Their, all about prophecy from the Bible, basically, right? Well, I wonder what Monday came from. You said you said the days of the week, and I always wonder what the. Monday. Yeah. The moon last, day. That's from, the moon day. The lunar day. Yeah. yeah. Lunar day. Yeah. So in different languages, will actually be called Luna or something like that for the yeah. day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Luna. Yep. Yeah. So. Lunas is Monday, basically. So we, might, we might be in trouble, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we're in trouble already, bro. Don't worry. <laughs> With all the stuff we're putting on here, but yeah, man. You know what bloodline you're on? Oh, uh, no, I don't. I like, go, oh, you're in big trouble, buddy. <laughs> man, that is so, so like, like, for example, like Prince Charles, everybody's yep. like, hey, it's probably going to be Prince Charles. I mean, everybody has these different uh, ideas because he's going to become king of everybody thinks that he's obviously on top. But well, yeah, I, heard his, so. I heard his wife is his cousin, though, that they didn't, they didn't breed a lot. Yeah, yeah. they do. I, you know what? I don't think King Charles um, is going to be a candidate for that. He may have been thought of when he was young, but yep, exactly, um, yeah, yeah. I think if it's going to be anybody, it's probably going to be William. Yeah, but, that's what I thought too. I really did because yeah. I started. Uh, they they had From him specially line, born. Anyways. They had yeah. him specially born on the summer solstice day, like like Prince Charles was telling yeah. uh, 
his wife that, Hey, I, I, you're going to, you, you, I know you want to get this because she kept saying, I want to get this baby out of me. I want to get this baby out of me. And he said, no, you're not going to have it to this specific day. Right. Yeah. And he ended up having it on that specific day, which, you know, obviously for witches and all these, uh, Satanists, yeah, it's, important. Love that. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. People have to understand that just be, they think that just Christianity is like the only thing that moved on after, you know, certain times there's, there's a lot of religions and a lot of like weird stuff that's still going on today that people don't understand that yeah. they do worship this stuff. And they, they don't, they're like, you're crazy. They don't believe in Moloch. They don't believe in Yeah, the, yeah they do. <laughs> they do. Yes, they they do. do. <laughs> they just don't do, they don't show it to you, but they no. Alex yeah. Jones is the only guy that got in there, you know, to, to see, witness the Moloch. Uh, <laughs> I'm just <Yeah>. kidding. <laughs> you never know though. Man. You yeah, never, never know. know. Yeah. You never know. So um what's what's let's talk a little bit about the black nobility from italy just so yes that, the papal bloodlines man let's let's, let's yeah. see what's going on with so, that so one of the things that people probably don't want to hear but you need to understand whether or not it has been uh polytheism or it has been christianity they want to control the complete organizational structure and hierarchy so in polytheism and i've talked about this on probably on, on some of the shows in the past with you is that right from the antediluvian times and then very quickly after the flood you have an organizational structure that has the divine representative of the gods which is the bloodlines from the Rephaim or the nephilim um, and you have a queen and that's representative of the the mother goddess and the male god and you also have the mystical religion. That's the okay. organizational structure. And the priests were all part of the bloodline. Yeah. They, they ran things in polytheism. And you would also have um, a larger family that would run the rest of the upper nobility, right? So they would control all of the education and only the rich were educated right? And into degrees, because that education is, in, is the mysticism of degrees. Yeah. <laughs> um, and still is to today. Yeah. Uh, and they would control all the upper levels of the four levels of, of the society, which the, you'd have the slave class and the working class, you know, at the bottom, and you might have a small entrepreneur entrepreneurial class like bakers and blacksmiths yeah. and stuff like that. And so they controlled that. And so when you have Judaism basically being dispersed around the world, uh, and then you have Christianity coming out of Judaism with, with uh, Jesus being crucified and then spreading around the world, and then it gets what most people think is control of the Roman Empire, except that it's not really the Jerusalem church anymore. Yeah. Like this has got a hierarchy to it instead of this flat organizational structure. Yeah. And you have Mithraism or Mithraism and um, Sol Invictus as the main sort of homogenizing with a whole bunch of Egyptian imagery that's going to be moved into it to pacify the empire because he was just trying to do what the king of Persia a hundred years before that, King Shapur, where he used Zoroastrianism, that Mithraism comes out of, yeah. used that to, to unite his empire. And, and yeah. Constant, Const, Constantine, Constantine yeah. was yeah. One, wanting to do the same thing. Yeah. And so it was really a different sort of variety. And then not so long after that, members of the bloodline, like the third sons or the daughters would start to move in and got control of the hierarchy of, of the church. And then they also utilized all of these moles that I would, that I, that I call from the Manichaeans and all sorts of polytheist organizations that were kind of forced under underground to a certain degree, right? So you get yeah. these orders of whether it's the Franciscan monks or it's the Benedictine monks or any of those monastic orders. Those are all Gnostics and polytheists that were molded into the Roman church. And it's mm. modeled after the Essenes, which was the first monastic order in the West 
that was exported and or exported as its model from like the Buddhism um, monastic sort mm. of organization. And that's also why the Essenes are still held in high regard in the Masonic rituals and things, because they're one of the organizational structure basis along with the assassin organization of the Sufis, mm. which the Templar model took back to Europe to be the model for the secret societies in, 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 in Europe. So wow. They were they very early on were controlling through the money and the bloodlines and who they were sponsoring control of the popes. Yeah. And they'd done and there were some good popes, and there was a lot of really bad popes, but understand it was corrupted with politics and wealth and power and polytheism and you know, right throughout its 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 history. Um, and so we do have. I mean, the good thing we have is we, we have the Bible that was preserved. We have uh, yeah. beliefs preserved. I mean, it's not all bad. Some stuff but... came, yeah, some great stuff came out of it. You know, Constantine, I know they used to have like a Catholic church on top and below it, they yeah. would have like the Mithra church, right? So people yeah. were worshiping God up here and then all the people leave and all the hierarchies would go downstairs and go to the yeah. Mithra church and start yeah. worshiping Mithra, yeah. Yeah, but all the wealth, that's polytheism. That's part of their, their old religions, like yes. the pomp and the ceremony, the ritual, the yeah. idolatry, the imagery. Yeah. That wasn't part of the Jerusalem church. No, they just brought, yeah, because obviously the Bible talks about it. Like, you know, ever since the New I mean, the Old Testament, God's been talking about no, you know, no yeah. idols, put no idols before me. And then yeah. they just, they took yeah. all that stuff and, and just looks like they blended yeah. into one religion and, and um, changing, changing the uh, Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Yes. Stuff like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and then having like uh, having, celebrating uh, Mithra's birthday, birthday on December, December 25th, 25. Easter, I mean, Easter, right? Yeah. Easter, you know, that's like Tammuz is like 40 days, like Lent and all this stuff is like, it, all that stuff is just a blending of all these old religions. Right. And blending yes. into a so you're spiritually fornicating. Yeah, seriously, so, fornicating as polytheism is. That, I just looked that up. I didn't even know yeah. what the definition was until you <laughs> kind of like, man, I gotta look that up. What does that mean? And, and okay, <laughs> not, 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 I get it. What is not, not, I understand. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Right. So, it's all good. But, you're so smart, Gary. I'm like, man, I, everything you're talking about, I have to look up and I look it up and I'm like, yeah, yeah he's right. He's by the time on. you, by the well, time I, you look I, it up, I, you I, already I, moved to something else. Yeah. I, I, try yeah. not to, I try not to make up words, but sometimes no, you're I not. Do. You're not. No, you're not. Making <laughs> up I'm not trying to look it up to make it see if you're right or wrong. I'm looking it up to see if, 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 if what maybe I'm I can ask you a question real quick, yep. and then Gary's yeah, already yeah, bam yeah. on the next thing. You're like, ah, yeah. I can't get it, man. It's like this stuff is like. Is I get on I get on these rants. I can't this is amazing. It. Hey, this, this stuff. I, that's why these are the my my wife sometimes thinks that the episode's over because I'm listening so much. You know, because I'm yeah. a fa I'm a fan as well of this this research. So I'm like sitting yeah. there listening so much that I don't even speak. But yeah, go, go ahead though. Uh, when we're talking about the papal so, bloodlines. What's yeah, up? we're talking about the papal bloodline, and so they they basically have owned um, the the popes and you know the Borgia family, as I told you about. Um, Borgia, that was a grandmaster of the Montessa order that took over the Jesuits in 1570. Mm. I mean, there's three Borgia popes from that line. Yeah. Right. From that family line. So who are the black nobility? They call themselves the Maximus clan. Mm. Okay. okay. The, the, this is the Julio Claudian family from ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. So when you see the senators that were running Rome before, Mm -hmm. those are all the people who believe they descended from the gods and down through Romulus and Remus wow. as demigods and Raphaim after the flood. Wow. Yeah. And it splits into, you know, several families and, and some of the main older ones are, um, I'm just going to uh, read it. Oh, and they call it the gens Julia and the gens Claudius. Okay. So when you see that that Latin term gens as an LB gens, uh -huh. as an LB gensian, as an Albion, as in that meaning, um, an LB means white, as in, you know, pale skin like I am giants, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Albion yeah. was a giant in England along with Gog and Magog. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Okay. Ooh. So, and, and a gens goes back to a specific patriarch. A single mm -hmm. specific patriarch that started that whole mm. bloodline, right? Okay. Okay. All right. 
And so this is the Julio Claudian family line that also sort of intermarries. But some of the main branches that come out of it um, are the, the Gravina, the Bracciano, uh, the Vontorotondo, uh, the Pictiliano uh, are some of the main families. But some of the ones that people might be um, more familiar with would be Colono, Massimo, specifically the Orsini, yeah. the Ruspoli, the Palinici, the Theodi, the Sacchetti, the Borghese, which is another one that has really been um, working with the banking system of the church, of the yeah. Roman church. Uh, the Odalecci, uh, I won't go through all of them, but yet, yet yeah. understand that these are very powerful families that very few would have ever heard of. Yes. And, and they control it, all of the major cities. They would have a control that family would have would be centered in Venice or yeah. in Florence or whatever. Yeah. And the Medici's upset that. Yeah. Right. Because they were thought to be a combination of either Jewish and or Phoenician traders, maybe yeah. some mixed bloodline in there. And they uh, started as traders formed a small bank, but were very shrewd and ruthless yeah. and gained control and threw out the old family name. So you can imagine how brutal that would have been. And there's a series I watched though a, few, a couple of years ago about the Medici that I think it was, it's on Netflix. Uh, and it sort of walks through that in, wow. in, in, and not in the detail that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love to have them, <laughs> but you get you get the understanding of how the vicious idea of how ruthless take, and, yeah takeover so, was, and how the old families were pushing back. So okay, so I I know you mentioned Orsini, so uh, a lot of people you know would 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 talk about like um, you know Pepe Orsini maybe being the gray pope. Um, you know, like there's a black pope, a white pope, and then some people say that he's maybe the gray pope, and he's you know that's just. I don't know if that's uh, accurate information. I just, I just hear it thrown around, you know, the, the conspiracy circles. Um, is that accurate information there that he's, he's above the, the, the Jesuits and, and the gray and the white folks? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. okay. The, 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 all of them answer to the black nobility okay. of Italy that then answer into probably because they'll have the black nobility of Italy. will have people in the committee of 300, the, uh, family uh, or the uh, council of 33 yeah um, and but they would also from this roman bloodline there would be at least a few that are part of the 13 right yeah yeah so i know that the colonna and the orsini family end up um intermarrying right so then it just they yep. got more powerful and yep. um the farnese what about them i mean some people talk about that family as well you know that, that they're pretty powerful i don't know if that's they there. are i just don't know where they fit um, okay no problem but they don't I just... don't seem to be as ancient as some of the other names but okay the trouble is is you know when, when these ancient families were just few in number it, yeah. it's easier but there, there's so many additions over I know. And, each, it, and the genealogies just make your mind go to <laughs> because what, what happened is that, <laughs> that when the when the when they have a daughter right the daughter marries in prior another family so that that our cd family turns into this and it's hard to follow all that right yeah the male well, is probably easier what tends males. to happen is this is is it takes a very ennobled female to start a new family and a new coat of arms yeah, that's that's a tradition that goes back into ancient times with the uh, Nephilim, Raphaim, and particularly uh, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and in mm. there is that if they wanted to start a brand new dragon dynasty, they had to have the most ennobled um, female um, that wasn't just of one bloodline, but would be ennobled with several other ones to match with the first son of a um you know sort of pure bloodline yeah to start a new dynasty with right yeah. and then they go somewhere else to start that They'll probably dynasty. like start that dynasty and change the name of it but you know and then just yeah. start going up from there and, yeah. so now if you look at the coat of arms you'll notice you take pick whatever family that you want you're going to see many different variations of it right yeah the order That's, 
the order of golden fleece that you talked about when I looked at yeah. that coat of arms, that, yeah. that is like, that's why I was like, this has to be important. There is yeah. so much involved in that, that coat yeah. of arms. It's, 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 it's So what it's, happens is when you start a new family and you enter in a new scion, a new grafting in, you have to adjust that new coat of arms to reflect the histories coming together. Wow. So all of that imagery on the coat of arms is a taciturn communication to the royal families as to who their bloodlines go back to into wow. history. How awesome. And so when you look at some of the major figures that are on the coat of arms, you've got lions. Yep. You've got dragons. Yep. Uh, you've got eagles. Yep. And, and, and you've got unicorns. Wow. Right. These are in their belief system, angelic beings. Yeah. As the patriarch. So a unicorn he says, well, what's a unicorn? Yeah. Well, it's very, very similar to the eagle, which is the cherubim, because as cherubim as they're represented like the Anunnaki on earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You'll see sometimes they have a man's head and sometimes they have an eagle head, but they're only shown with one face at a That's time when they take a physical form. Is right. Is it? Isn't it mentioned in in uh, Ezekiel where there's like a face of a lion, the face yep. of a yep. eagle? The it's it's mentioned in Ezekiel, right? Yeah, it is Ezekiel one and Ezekiel ten. Okay. And so the eagle is is representing a bloodline from Cherubim. The unicorn is a little bit more allegorical, and I yeah. don't know why they go this way, but they're honoring. Um, not only at first I thought they were just honoring the horse that the Nephilim used to ride on in the antediluvian times with this chimera chimera type of uh, horse that was huge with this big horn and a few different other parts of other animals on there but as I realized and dug into it more I, I learned that it's an allegory that is used in in Greek mythology and others where you have like the vision in Ezekiel, a polytheist counter vision. So Zeus and Apollo, for example, are depicted as being having their chariot pulled yeah. by horses. Okay. Right. But some of them are unicorns. Wow. So if you can imagine in the rebellion, you have all ranks of angels and watchers, and troops mm -hmm. are also watchers, uh, mm -hmm. rebelling. Then if you have the troops that are pulling, the vision of God's throne in Ezekiel one and 10. Yeah. And I think the Psalms actually uh, has, has them pulling his chariot mm. in, in that verse that they are an allegory for a cherubim as well. So wow. a lion would be a, a lion God, like Nergal that's in the Bible. Right? Wow. Okay. Um, or Mahis in Egypt, Sekhmet, a lion God to produce Nephilim that look just like them, you know, as in wow. the, uh, lion men of moab and the lion-like men of gad and arioch the king out of mesopotamia that means lion-like arioch <laughs> and you know and so when you see like richard the lion heart out of the yeah. Anjou, and yeah and that imagery is going back to angelic beings wow it all and, traces and, back and that's course, why you call it that's why your book is called the genesis 6 conspiracy right yeah. because it all traces back to that basically which which i would love to yeah. finish your so, book it's just yeah. oh my gosh it's, and the dragons <laughs> are seraphim angels yeah yeah right and then you've got all these other imageries i won't go through all of them but you know you've got lilies you've got um you know all sorts of different things that are on there that is you know is sort of again talking about different main family bloodlines so that you're not going to have new symbols created because yeah. they all root back to that ancient one and all of yeah. those symbols would be reflected that's on the coat of arms that have been scioned into that family wow that's wow. so interesting that gets that's deeper than i even thought man i never even knew that i just i look at all the coat of arms i'm just barely at that part you know i'm looking at the coat of arms like that's i'm trying to study the families yeah. and i always like like obviously this episode i'm gonna have to do the same thing i'm gonna have to go through the families you mentioned because i have a list of like of families from like italy that i was studying but yeah. I missed a few, obviously, with, yeah. <laughs> with the ones you're so. You know, what re and really starts to get you freaked out is when you you connect a few more dots here now, and uh -huh. we've talked about the unicorn as being a cherubim, and 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 it is on the Stuart dynasty's 
coat of arms. Okay. And the Hanover coat of arms. I think the Stuart has a unicorn and a lion. The Hanover coat of arms that came over with the with the Germans um, that has become the Windsor family has two unicorns on it. Wow. Okay. And what's interesting about that, particularly as you look at the Stuart one, is that um, you have this word that has been put into the King James Version Bible, King James Stuart, mm-hmm. um, of the unicorn dynasty. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the word rem is the Hebrew word for a wild bull, but okay. that's been substituted in the Bible for the word unicorn. Wow. Yeah. So saw, it might not actually that. be yeah. a, a unicorn, but it, it could be, uh, it could be a unicorn bull. dynasty. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and it's strategically put in there to create wow. a mythos for the Stuart dynasty. And of course, he's the sponsor of the King James Version Bible, obviously. Oh, it's, my uh, gosh. All right. <laughs> this is, all right. All right. So that gets even more intense. Yeah. Well, and of course, the unicorn is used a couple of times in association because it's not used that many times in the Bible, but with Mount Hermon. Yeah. Because he, he, King James was the one who made famous at least in modern times his divine right to rule that comes from the balim of mount Hermon. oh wow mm. so there's a couple of families that i was that i was kind of looking into i don't know if i'm in the right area like the house of uh, Bur- bourbon which is b-o-u-r-b-o-n yeah yeah that's is that a pretty powerful one to to kind of look that's into the, yeah they have they currently have the king of jerusalem title okay and that is um king philippe and he yeah. inherited from his father, Juan Carlos, and they got that from the um, Habsburg Lorraine dynasty through okay. the marriage. Okay, so there's that. And then there's like the Hohe and Hohe and Lohe. Uh, I, that's just something that I, I, I pulled up. Um, is that never you, heard of I, them? Never heard of that one. <laughs> It's yeah. Hohe, it's H-O-H-E-N-L-O-H-E. Um, that's a pretty, pretty interesting thing. I was kind of looking into a role, the Holy Rome, Roman Empire. Okay, well, I'll, I'll have to X that Yeah, I'm one not off. familiar with that one. <laughs> well, some other, some other names in terms of European that you need to be aware of. I mean, we talked about de Bouillon and de Payon and Anjou who produced the Plantagenet. The St. Clair we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Champagne, as in Champagne. Okay. Bruce, we've talked about. Geezer, we've talked about. Fontaine is another one. Uh, St. Clair de Geezer. Habsburgs, we've talked about. Joinville, Brian, St. Clair de Neg, uh, our main ones. Obviously, the Windsors that we've talked about and the mm-hmm. Bourbon. Those are sort of the main old families that I've traced. There's going to be a few more because I've not gotten into Poland and I've not gotten into the, you know, obviously there's the Kaisers in Germany. This is, yeah. this is basically just France and um, Italy and, and, yeah. and, and, and England. Right. So yeah. in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, and all, I remember all the families that I did mention to you. Um, uh, those are all, you know, I remember, I remember that like the 13 bloodlines, like that somebody yep. came out with, like, those are all yep. just Western, you know, yes. smaller families. So all yes. the stuff that you're mentioning are the big, the good, good ones to look into. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the Paysur family, P-A-Y-S-U-E-R family. Is that, uh, how do they fit into the black nobility? Have you heard yeah. of them? Not familiar with them. So. Okay. All right. That's another one that somebody had, had, had sent to me. Gary Wayne knows and know them. They don't exist. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just. It's, it's a matter a smaller of level. how far do you want to dig, right? Yeah, there might be on yeah. a smaller level. They might yeah, they be could like, change their name. You know, they could change their name. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, from generation to generation as they intermarry. So, okay. Well, um, well, we got probably another ten minutes left. Is there anything, anything you want to kind of uh, add to to this uh, to this episode that that would just you know that people need to look into and study that's important that maybe relates to the Bible or end times, anything like that? Well, the the, the big thing that you know, that they're working on, you know, they're, they're the ones that are manufacturing the great reset. Mm -hmm. Um, And the idea behind that is, is to, and you see Biden with the build back better that's sponsored by them as well. It's designed to bankrupt the world so that uh, all the visible assets are gone. I mean, they're the ones that are off the books that they have yeah yeah they're gonna keep that one yeah that's not gonna get lost <laughs> the shirts. and it, it is it they want that so that they can uh in exchange for forgiving everybody's debts mm-hmm. and the country's debts 
Yeah. And they're not worried about the country because they're going to lend it, you know, money to finance them going forward with a very low interest rate. And yeah. even rich people um, who are working for them, they're going to lose their money, but they're going to still have these positions to earn it back very quickly after yeah. the reset. It's designed to get the masses to give up all of their property mm -hmm. in return for relief of their debt or their tax obligation of the debt. Yeah. Yeah. And that would maybe be maybe bankrupting our country or, you know, bankrupting the, that would kind of bring in the one world uh, the, uh, financial currency, right? Yeah. And they're going to even wrap it into what they call a terminology of a jubilee of forgiving of debts. Yeah. So the, everybody's like, oh, like what they do is they, it's like the, uh, they create a problem and they already have a yeah. solution like the he Hegelian dialectic, yeah. right? So yeah. people but are like begging for it, right? Yeah. That's what but they did with- yeah. I'm sorry. Can you imagine though a world now then where you don't own your own home? Yeah, I know. I, I, this I is the tell. feudal system. That's like how the they get there. Yeah, like BlackRock and uh, Vanguard, like they're all buying up everything, you know. And, and it's yeah, it's just it's it's crazy, man. It's yep. it is crazy, and that's going to be uh, the socialist yep. system, right? Yep. Basically, and then they're going to seize all of the the cash assets you have in the banks and whatever yep. as part of it. It's and it's what it does do. It does what China did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where on a was, major scale, right? Yeah, on a worldwide because, scale. On a worldwide of, scale. So China at one time was probably the most equal country in the world, but yeah. it was the poorest except for the adepts or the oligarchs or the ruling class, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and that's that feudal system that they want to recreate. Yeah. But worldwide. Worldwide. The one world yeah. government, one world religion, one world currency, which, which they, they want to. Yeah. That's what they've yeah. been aiming for, right? And then bring yeah. in the Antichrist, bring in the false prophet, and, and really start getting things rolling, right? Yeah. All right. So All right. keep Man. keep in All mind connects. in terms of those types of things that, that they're working with to, to, to get where they want to go. And, of course, they will utilize every catastrophe to uh -huh. move things in that direction. Yeah. Because most of the catastrophes that they're going to take advantage of are contrived. Yes, they're made so, of. Yeah, they make them. Just yeah, like these the little false are, flags. Yeah. They, they the make, they make these false flags. Yeah. Birth pangs are contrived disasters. Yes. Yeah. How and amazing. So yeah. they're going to bring them about. So they're going to be able to predict it a little bit more. It never works the way they want it to quite work. Yeah. But they keep moving in that direction. Right. So it's going to get a little bit more, more messier there in terms of, of the debt. But I mean, could you imagine the size of the debts that our governments have run up uh, <laughs> yeah, during the time of the pestilence? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's going to be insane. Um, so what's my last thing I want to say? Okay. So Gary, if you could think of any subject that you would like to go over that's Christian and conspiracy, like for another show, just let me know. I think we've gone over good secret societies. We've gone over the Jesuits. We've gone over like the, the Genesis six giants. Um, if you could think of anything, uh, oops, I tapped my microphone. If there's anything that you can think <laughs> of, uh, subject wise, I would love to have you on, you know, maybe next month or, you know, a month after that, something like that, if you're okay with that. Yeah. We, yeah. Let me see whether, um, we can get a date in, in May after May. Um, I go to my cottage for three months, so I can't do video. I can do audio, but I can't do video. Okay. Well, so, we'll have to do it in May then. Just think of something yeah. if, if you can, if, if, when, when yep. you have a day available, we'll yep. get you back on the show. I mean, this is a Christian and conspiracy podcast. Maybe we can get a little biblical, you know, yep. uh, like on, on the next show that we do, because we did like conspiracy. Now we could get biblical if you're okay with that. And we could, uh, you know, let me know what you'd like to do. And I'd like love to have you on in May. That's okay. all right with you. Yep. I'll get you a date. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Day God bless subject. you. God bless you. If, if there's anything else, do you have an Instagram or anything like that or anything that, that anybody could follow? Uh, the, only, the only thing I'm using right now is Facebook. So people can get a hold of me on Messenger or on okay. my timeline. Okay. Uh, who knows? I might come back on Twitter. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> um, but I, it? <laughs> but I basically kidding. shut down most of my media because uh, I didn't like what obviously has been going on yeah and i didn't want to be trying to do 500 different media platforms i know wasn't really reaching anybody you can't keep up yeah you can't yeah. keep up it's hard. and and twitter i was so disgusted with i just stopped yeah it completely yeah. and some of the other ones so i'd like to sort of expand on that and then the other way is to get hold of me through my website yeah genesis 6 seriously.com there's a contact the author um perfect uh, button there uh, if you're want to know a little bit more about my book i have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters 
Yeah. Um, so you'll, you know, people will get a good feel for whether or not it's the right book for them or not. And you can buy it off my website and get a signed one, or you can link over to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or to Kindle to get the digital version. So lots of ways to get a, get a hold of the book. Then that's the easiest way, way to do it. I am on just finishing up chapter 62 of the sequel. Perfect. <laughs> All right, um, guys. Be expecting another one, and then Gary can come on, and and you know we'll have him come yep. on and hopefully talk about by the fall I've got it out. But uh, I, I think it'll be about seventy five chapters, maybe eighty when it's yeah. Done, so see, this is deep, deep research, guys. And and like I say, Gary comes on for free. All I could say is, guys, please just purchase this book. You know, I don't I don't ever ask anybody for money. Our show is all free. We don't ever charge anybody. We're not going to charge people. You know, um. So you know, Gary is just takes his time out. Um, he's a very busy person. Obviously he's got so many different podcasts he's doing. So if you guys could please support Gary Wayne, uh, purchase his book. Um, and also leave us, uh, uh, um, you know, if you guys could please leave comments below, subscribe to the channel. If you guys could, please, all we're trying to do is just expose the, the, the evil in this world. And we're trying to also bring you to the Bible and show you guys the real truth, the truth that's on your nightstand guys. Okay. Thank you so much. And Jason, thank you, bro. We're, uh, no, no, hopefully, no. hopefully tonight we can get some sleep. We both have a newborn and we're yeah, like, we're like beat right now. Gary, thank you. I just, I just love listening to him. Yeah, me good. too. I get blown away every time I have you on, Gary. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank God you for taking you. your time out and coming out, coming back on. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you. I love I love coming on the show. It's it's always a lot of fun. Thank God you bless so you. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You so All right, guys. No. All right, guys, I have to end this in prayer. I forgot. Uh, let's bow our heads. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for blessing us with this uh, awesome podcast, Exposing Evil. Lord, if you could, I pray for uh, Gary, uh, for his family. I pray for Jason and his family. I pray for anybody that that has uh, kids in the NICU right now. I'm um, Seriously, I, I had it happen to me. Um, anybody that's lost a child, I, I pray, Lord, please put your healing hand on them. Also for Gary's family, um, I, I really want to just say thank you so much uh, for blessing us with uh, meeting Gary because he's really given us a lot of research and, and fine material for people to study um, and also some great biblical stuff that, that people need to get into. So thank you, Lord, for that. We appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, guys. Thank you amen. so much. We appreciate you guys. I hope good night, that good night Gary. Well. You have a good night, yeah. guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>